We're back. For the first time, the Navy SEAL who shot and killed Osama bin Laden has given his personal account of the raid that night, speaking exclusively to my old editor at the San Francisco Chronicle and now executive chairman of the Center for Investigative Reporting, Phil Bronstein. In the March edition of Esquire, the former Navy SEAL gives chilling details of that historic night, from counting back and forth to a thousand, which he did during the 90-minute helicopter ride to Abbottabad, and then thinking about a quote from President George W. Bush's 9-11 speech over and over again in his head, then storming bin Laden's compound and walking through the dark hallway to the third floor, coming face to face with the most wanted man in the world. Well, the Navy SEAL says, quote, he looked confused and way taller than I was expecting. He's got a gun within reach. He's a threat. In that second, I shot him two times in the forehead. Bap, bap. The second time as he's going down, he crumbled onto the floor in front of his bed and I hit him again. Bap. The former SEAL, who retired last year, also talks about his uncertain future and living in constant fear that his identity could be exposed, even telling his children to never say the name Osama bin Laden. With me now, Phil Bronstein, who broke and wrote the story. Phil, sir, thank you so much for this. A couple questions as a journalist and about your trade craft here. How did you find this Navy SEAL? How did you ID him yourself? And how did you get him to talk? Well, Chris, the... Finding him really happened through more of a social contact. We had some mutual friends. Uh, they talked to me before I ever met him. He and I had a number of phone conversations where I, I, didn't, I still didn't know who he was. I, know who he, I knew what he'd done. Uh, and then gradually he, I trust developed, and, you know, we started talking more and more. I met him face-to-face. That, that, those kinds of meetings happened probably dozens of times. And then this really took place over a year and a quarter. Uh, How long did it take for him to open up and actually give you a narrative of killing bin Laden? I would say that that really the first long narrative happened right after he got out of the service, which was the beginning of September, beginning of September last year. And you also got confirmation from the point man. There's only two men up on that third floor. And the other guy there told someone else that he was the guy. In fact, the guy you talked to was, in fact, the shooter. Yes. And the, I mean, the point man talked to people. Point man hasn't really talked publicly at all, probably never will, from what I can understand of the point man. But I also I mean, there were dinners, Chris, a week after the mission with people, SEALs who were on the mission and the shooter talking very openly about what had happened. I talked to a variety of people, civilians and military who were at that dinner. There's the mentor I talk about in the in the story, who's a an older retired SEAL who went on to Blackwater. And then the CIA got a call from a very high level government official several hours after the raid in Abbottabad saying it was your guy. Now, this fellow, we're not going to use his name because we don't know it. You didn't put it in the piece. You're not exposing him in any way. This fellow, according to your piece, has also killed 30 people in combat. So how does this fit into his record and his, and his conscience, doing his duty, getting the bad guys? I thought it was wonderful that he talked about what George W. said after 9-11, that this was something we have to defend our country. This has to be dealt with as a very moral obligation on our country's part. But how does he deal with all this killing? Well, I think he deals with it uh, through struggling, as all these guys do. I mean, one of the points of this piece and one of the points of the piece that he and I agreed would be the context of the piece was not just the raid. It, what, it's what happens to these guys afterwards. Not a pretty picture oftentimes, uh, abandoned somewhat by the government, not absorbed uh, in the private uh, enterprise system in any way that they should be, considering all the skills that they have. So that was the kind of context of the piece. And he's he's a guy who wanted to portray the human side of that. Yeah. So there's a, there's a story in there about his wife finding him uh, with, with a bottle of Ambien pills and his gun, his pistol one night, you know, contemplating suicide. Yeah. Well, the thing is about how we, he wanted to be a sniper. He's a good shot. Obviously, he's very effective. What is a sniper supposed to do when he leaves the service? I mean, what's the next... What does that plan you, uh, prepare you for in, in making a living, which you have to do because he didn't get a retirement? Well, Chris, keep in mind that, you know, snipers, there are a lot of snipers in the military. So aside from being a sniper, he's a Navy SEAL. And aside from being a Navy SEAL, he's a SEAL Team 6. It's the highest level of training, the highest level of classification, the highest secrecy level there is. And so he learns all sorts of things. He's been doing it for 16 years. And so he yeah. learns resolve. He learns patience. He learns grace and decision making under pressure. He learns all the things, in other words, that uh, many of our CEOs would love to have. So you think he could find a way to transition into something peaceful? Well, yes, but there has to be a mechanism for transitioning. So I talked to Dick Costello, who's the CEO of Twitter, uh, and, and Jeff Clark, who's the chairman of Orbitz in San Francisco, where I live. 
And basically, both of them said, we'd love to help these guys. There are other CEOs around the country. I spoke with some in, in Manhattan here the other night. They want to help these guys. They need a mechanism. They need an organizing okay. principle. Well, the movie Zero Dark Thirty, which I saw portrayed the character Maya, the female CIA agent who was key to locating bin Laden. Well, in your piece, the former Navy SEAL made reference to an agency woman, he called her, who identified bin Laden's body for him, saying, quote, back at the Jalalabad base, we pulled bin Laden out of the bag. I brought the agency woman over. I still had all my stuff on. We looked down and I asked, is this the guy? Is this your guy? She was crying. That's when I took my magazine out of my gun and gave it to her as a souvenir. What a moment. What a moment. And he said, do you have room in your backpack for this? Yeah. And then then he then he didn't see her after that because they went on to Bagram for further inspection of okay. Bin Laden's body. Phil Bronstein, fabulous journalism. As Thank you. you. Know. Thank you. And Chris. you must know how good a piece of work you did. You did. It. Well, You've done we used it again, to do that Phil. together. We used to do I that know, together, I'm, Chris. You were a great editor when I served you well. <laughs> Thank I think. You. Anyway, you when we return, let me finish with Dick Cheney's ongoing record of, let's face it, being wrong. You're watching Hardball, the place for politics.